we're here this morning to be able to acknowledge you as our Lord. We pray, God, that you will help us to, to put aside all those other things that are in our minds and hearts that, that um, take over and, um, you know, bring us down, those things that are distracting us, these anxieties that are going on in our lives. We pray, God, that you will be able to take those away from us and give us this opportunity that we can just stay focused on you, that we can be able to worship you with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and um, we'll be able to hear the words that you have to speak to us today. And let us not, let that not, not be, just be some words that just to puff us up with, with knowledge, but to help us to be able to do something different with our lives, to be able to go in a new direction, in a way that we'll be able to find the kind of purpose that you have for us. Help us to be able to, to go in a new direction and uh, be able to carry out your will, Lord. Maybe for the first time in our lives, we're getting back on track in ways that we um, know that we're actually making a difference in this world. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, amen. Why don't you go ahead and grab a seat. See, well, we've got your little late, my name's Pastor Greg. Thank you for being here today. You're here last week of a sermon series that we've been doing over the last five weeks. And what we've been looking at uh, in the course of these weeks is we've been looking at construction. In fact, the name of this sermon series is simply is Under Construction. And what we've been looking at is really our lives and how our lives are really in a place of construction. In fact, we've been looking at the big word sanctification. And what sanctification means is really this work that God has done and this work that he is doing in our lives. That we, each and every single one of us, are in the process of sanctification of what God is doing. So what we've been doing is trying to understand a little bit more about what this means and how it looks in our life. And so that's what we've been unpacking the last few weeks. And in order to do that, we've been sort of equating it to construction. We've been equating it to a remodel, a rehabilitation of a house. We, we talked about how in a house we're going to take it all the way down to the foundation. That we're going to rebuild the framing. Last week we started talking about the shingles. That which protects us from the rain, from the snow that comes down. It, it protects the house from having mold to begin to grow in it. We talked about black mold. That was fun. A little gross. Yeah, nasty. But last week we said the shingles in our lives are the relationships, the people that we have. And when we have a relationship, when we have people in our lives, they help protect us. Protect us from that mold. Protect us from that rain that comes down. They become shingles in our life. And if you've ever worked on a project, built something, uh, been in a rehabilitation, or simply moved from one house to another, you know the relief that you have when it's finally done. When all the walls are up, when all your stuff is in, when you finally take that last box that you have and you unpack it, you put everything on the shelf, you know the relief that happens. And I was trying to think back to, uh, for, for my family, we've moved a lot, especially since we came to Arizona. I was trying to figure it out, but I think maybe we were in six houses in five years. It's not because we're bad tenants either, all right? So don't get any ideas like that. It's like the, the Lord just kept moving. The Lord just kept blessing us in different areas. And so we've moved a lot, especially in those first five years. As an opportunity opened, we would take it. We would move to these other houses. And I remember every time when we would move all our stuff into a new house, there was a moment when the house went from being a house to being a home. There was something that we did that when we did it, it moved from just being a house to actually being a home. And what we would do is that we would take something that followed us to each and every single home. And it was our welcome mat. This is my actual welcome mat. It looks like it's been through six homes, doesn't it? It's a little rugged. It's seen better days. But we'd take this thing and we would place it right in front of the front door. Almost like a message to say, okay, we have this house, right? And now we want people to come to know that they are welcome to come here. Now, I thought about the no trespassing, trespassers will be shot sign too, but uh, I didn't think I'd be too good for the pastor to have that, you know? So I said, all right, we're going to get the welcome mat. We're going to put the welcome mat out there. But I wanted people to know that when they came to my house, that they're welcome there. That we've prepared a place for them to come. That we want them to be there. 
And when we're talking about your spiritual house, the house that is constructed, that we've been working on, that, that God has been working on in your life, my question for you this morning is, do you have a welcome mat out in front of your spiritual house? Is God open to continue to come into your life, to open up that front door and to come into your life? Are there areas where you just don't want God to be there, where you want to put that no trespassing sign? Are there areas of your life that you have a no trespassing sign up for God? God, you can do whatever you want, but don't you go there. Don't you go to that place. Trespassers will be shut. Is that the sign you have up for certain areas of your life? Because if we want to see God work in every area of our life, we have to learn to take this welcome mat and put it in front of our life and say, God, every area is open to you. I want you to come in. I want you to have your way. My life is welcome to the movement of God inside of me. See, it's a very important place for us to be because God wants to continue to move inside of our lives. I was thinking back, and I was thinking back to sort of high school and science class. Any science fans out there? All right, one. Yes. All right, great. I remember science, and, and one of the classes that I really didn't like was physics. Passed it with a strong D plus, man. It was great. Uh, it was difficult for me, physics. But one thing I remember, I remember the guy that had an apple that fell on his head. What was his name? Newton, everybody remembers Newton. Newton, he had a lot of laws, right? He'd come up with all these laws and all these things. Well, if you remember science and you remember Newton, the first law of motion, this is Newton's first law of motion, said this. Everything continues in a state of rest unless it is compelled to change by forces impressed upon it. I'm going to say it again. Everything continues in a state of rest unless it is compelled to change by forces impressed upon it. And I want to let you know that probably when Newton came up with this law, he wasn't thinking about our spiritual lives, but he could have been thinking of our spiritual lives. Because I want you to know that spiritually in your life, you could be at a place of rest until forces are impressed upon you to change. And in fact, we see that oftentimes in church. Someone comes and they come to know Christ and, and, and then they're there and then that's where everything stops. And so they find themselves seated, plated, and they're here sitting on their hands, not moving forward in a stale place. And they've been there for year after year, decade after decade, because they're not allowing a force to be impressed Upon them. See, God is in the business of having us move forward. He is in the business of changing us. He doesn't want us to be the same next year that we are this year. He is in the process of change in our life. And in order to do that, He allows forces to be impressed upon us. Now, spiritually, when we look at our spiritual lives, the force that is impressed upon us is the force of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The Holy Spirit comes into our lives and changes us. That we're not the same today that we were last year because of the work that the Holy Spirit has done and is doing in our life. However, it is not very easy sometimes to leave the welcome mat for the Holy Spirit to come and say, come into any area of my life. Come into every area of my life. Whatever you want me to do, God, I'm willing to do it. That is is not an easy thing to do. Now let me ask you a question. My question for you this morning is simply this. Why is it difficult to leave the welcome mat out for the Holy Spirit? In fact, I want you to answer that. Why is it difficult to leave the welcome mat out for the Holy Spirit? What do you think? You want control. You want control. That's right. We want control. I want to be able to control this. And if I let God into this area, he's going to have control. And I don't want that. I want the control. Yes. If he'll what? If he'll what? I couldn't hear you really. What he'll think of you. Okay, what he'll think of you. Okay, God, if I let him, in, if God, if I let you into this area, what will you think of me? You know, will will, will there be some some shame involved if I let you in this area, or, or or some anger? Will you be angry? Will you be upset? Good example. Yes. What if I had to actually change my behavior? <laughs> 
<laughs> what if I had to change my behavior? If I don't let them into this area, it's like, no, 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 no. You know, if I can't hear you, if I don't let you in, if I don't see it, if I don't read it, if I don't know it, then I don't have to change. But if I begin to allow God into this area, I may have to change the way that I'm living. These are all great examples. I'm sure we can come up with a bunch more examples of why it is difficult to let the Holy Spirit into our lives. But we know that it is vitally important for our growth. That for us to grow and continue to grow as believers, we have to allow God to continue to have control to nudge us, to change us, to uh, examine areas that need examined and a lot, give us the courage and the ability to change those areas. Now, let's look at why. I want you to grab your Bible, and let's start our journey, and if you don't have one, there's one under the seat, or you can nestle up to your neighbor if they wore their deodorant today, you can get really close to them, all right? If not, just grab a different Bible. And uh, we're going to open up the book of 2 Corinthians, okay? Now, if you're not familiar with the Bible, go open about two-thirds, you're going to find Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Keep flipping, you're going to hit the book of Acts. Keep flipping, you're going to hit the book of Romans. Now we're going to enter the land of Corinth, right? This is Corinthian land, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, after the book of Romans. And we're going to look for big number number 3, all right? That's chapter number 3 in uh, 2 Corinthians. So if you follow 1 Corinthians, keep flipping a second. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And as you're flipping there, let me tell you, uh, this was a letter. It was a letter that was written by Paul to the church in Corinth. And so he wrote a there's two letters that are recorded in Scripture that he wrote, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Now, what I need you to know as we read these words is that Paul wrote these words to a church in Corinth. Not a church building, a church people, followers of Jesus in this city of Corinth. And in the same way that there were followers of Jesus in the city of Corinth, there are followers of Jesus in the town of Wickenburg. And the words that we're about to read that were originally penned for this church in Corinth is also as equally true for this church in Wickenburg, Arizona today. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 16. Here we go. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Now, I know there's a lot we looked at right there. Let's just break it down just a little bit. See it right at the beginning. Verse 16 says, But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Listen, if you're here today and you have turned to Jesus, you have put your faith, your hope, and your trust to Jesus, this describes you. It's saying the veil is taken away. What does that mean? Well, it's an Old Old Testament example, but really when we think about it in our lives, we see things differently after we follow Jesus than we saw before we followed Jesus. It's like when we came to Jesus, he took like blinders off of our eyes and allowed us to see the truth for maybe the first time in our lives, where we look and we're able to see and understand things. I'm sure that if I ask you, do you see things the same now that you saw before you knew Christ, you would probably say no. In fact, sometimes I look at some of the things that I wrote before I knew Jesus, and I read them today, and I don't even know who that person is. God has changed me so much that I am dead to that old person, and I'm alive to someone that's new. I see things differently. If you're here and you're following Jesus, you're seeing things, you're seeing life in a different way. The veil has been lifted, your eyes are open. But it doesn't stop there because it continues on in this portion of scripture. And here's what it says. And we all who with unveiled faces, that's you, unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. That you, 
unveiled, are being transformed into his image. That God is changing you. That you're not the same person today that you were yesterday. That he is in the process of changing you. That's what it means to follow after Christ. We don't want to be the same decade after decade. We want to become different people because we want to become more like him. Amen? Amen. Now, my question for you really is simply this. Are you changing? If you look back five years ago, are you the same person that you were? Or are you changing? Are you beginning in your life to look more like God? Look more like Christ? Are the attributes of your life more like God or more distant from God or just the same that they've always been? Are you seeing God move in your life? Are you seeing God do things in your life? Are you becoming someone different. See, God wants this to happen in our life. He wants us to be changing to become more in his image. Now, the problem with that is that change is not easy, is it? No, no, no one wants change. And the reality is, is that change is difficult. Change is difficult, but not changing is fatal. Change is difficult, but not changing is fatal. We, we can't stay the same. We have to be changing. A living organism is always changing. When things stop changing, they are dying. We don't want to be dying. We want to be living and growing. And so we have to be changing. But it was, uh, it was the Duke of Cambridge who said this about change. He said, any change at any time for any reason is to be deplored. Now, some of you guys may not know deplored. Deplored simply means to feel or express strong disapproval of. So let me read it again. Any change at any time for any reason is to be strongly disapproved of. And if you've ever worked in an organization, then you know this is absolutely true, right? Change in a company is very difficult. But let me tell you, even more so, change in your life is also very difficult. A lot of us are in a place where we know things have to change. It's just scary to go to that place. It's scary to not know what that future will hold. It's scary to know if I surrender this area of my life, what will I become? What will God do? Well, the Holy Spirit is always going to be moving in our life, and He's going to be bringing about change, and there's different ways that He's going to do that. Now, sometimes the Holy Spirit comes into our life, and it's, it's a gentle nudge, right? It, not, gentle nudges are nice, especially when the Holy Spirit's involved, right? I mean, there may just be an area of your life where He's like, yeah, you probably don't want to go that way. You probably don't want to do this thing. And in the book of Acts, in the Bible, there's story after story after story of gentle nudges. Times where the Holy Spirit is directing lives and leading them in the way that he wants them to go. I'm not going to tell them all to you, but I'll just point out a couple and tell you what ends up happening. The Apostle Paul is one story in the book of Acts chapter 16, verse 6. Paul wanted to go in a certain direction. He wanted to go to this place to minister to them about Jesus. The door kept being closed. He kept knocking, kept banging. The door wouldn't open. And the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit is the one who kept that door shut because God had a different agenda, a different place for him to go. Listen, if you're here today and you keep pounding and pounding and pounding and that door's not opening, maybe that's a nudge from the Holy Spirit that he's got another direction for you to go. Now, there's another example in the book of Acts. It's about a different guy. His name was Philip. Philip's going about his daily business, sort of enjoying life, loving Jesus, living it. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes and says, Philip, I want you to go to this place. I want you to go stand by this chariot. That's what happens. So he, he does. He's obedient. He goes and he stands next to this chari chariot. The next thing you know, he's inside this chariot ministering the gospel to an Ethiopian eunuch. Right? Someone that didn't know Jesus is now hearing about Jesus for the very first time. The Ethiopian eunuch follows Jesus, and in that moment, they're passing by a body of water. They get out, and this Ethiopian eunuch is water baptized in that moment. And then Philip goes right back to what he was doing, goes right back in the next direction. 
See, the Holy Spirit intervened in that moment to direct him to go because he had an agenda for him to do. In the same way, there's going to be things that happen in your life. Maybe the Holy Spirit just directs you in this way, and it may even be inconvenient for you. I don't know, maybe it was inconvenient for Philip to go and to do this. But he did it anyway, and a life was saved. God can do the same thing in your life, too. There's one other example in the book of Acts chapter 2. The early disciples open up the Bible. They begin to minister. They begin to preach to this large group of individuals. And as they preach to this large group of individuals, the Bible tells us that hearts were open and lives were changed. There was an incredible revival in Acts chapter 2 of people starting to follow after God. Let me tell you, that was a nudge of the Holy Spirit to begin to share God's word with these people. In the same way, the Holy Spirit can work in your life. Maybe when you're at school. Maybe when you're at your workplace. There may be a Bible verse that you've been thinking about, you've been studying on. And the next thing you know, you're sitting in a conversation over, over lunch break. And you begin to share this because the Holy Spirit nudges you. They're changed. Next thing you know, your whole office has revival. And it's just this incredible thing, but it happened from a gentle nudge of the Holy Spirit in your life. Sometimes that's how the Holy Spirit works. Now, there's other times, though, where it's not a gentle nudge. In fact, there's some times in our lives where the Holy Spirit can speak through difficulty that we face, tough times that we face. Sometimes there's the repercussions of our decisions coming back into our lives. You know, there's a saying, it says this, some people change when they see the light, others when they feel the heat. We got some heat feelers out there today, you know. Uh, you know, we see the light, but we just keep on going. And next thing you know, we feel the heat, and that heat causes us to change. See, it's okay. God, the Holy Spirit can use difficulty in our life to change us if our ears are open and we're willing to be obedient and follow after Him. But sometimes in our life, there's areas that we, we, we don't allow God to work. Remember we talked about that welcome mat in the middle? We've got a welcome mat on this area and this area. But in this area, we've got do not trespass. In this area, we've got trespassers will be shot. We don't want anybody in this area of our life. That's our own little secret area. And we're not there going to allow God into that area. There was a guy, he was actually in Bible college, and he was like that. He had areas of his life that he would let God, but there were other areas that were top secret. He didn't, didn't want God in these areas at all. He was sitting in class, and the professor was t talking about letting God into every area of your life. Even those areas that you think God's going to be mad at. He would say, let God into that area of your life. His heart was like, just, yes, that's what I need to do. And so he went home, and he grabbed all these note cards. He took all these note cards, and on every note card he put a letter, right? And he wanted to be reminded to let God into every area. So he put one L, E, T, G, O, D. And he set them up on his bookshelf so that every time that he walked past his bookshelf, he would see these letters. Let God. Well, this one day he was in his, in his dorm room, and he was just walking back and forth, and he was just praying. He was like, God, I, I just want to let you into this area of my life. And God, I just want to let you into that area of my life. And I know this area is really dark and it's sort of scaring me, but I want to let you into this area of my life too. All of a sudden, this breeze came up and, and, and one of those note cards just flew up in the air and just fell down on the ground. He turned around to look at what he saw and he looked back up at his bookshelf and he saw the note cards, except now they were a little different. It was L-E-T-G-O. The Holy Spirit spoke to his heart in that moment and says, if you want to let me into these areas, you're going to have to learn how to let go. See, these areas that we have the do not, uh, do not enter sign, the you're not allowed to trespass sign, the trespassers will be shot. Those are areas that we're holding on to with our hands that we hold on to really tight because we control those areas. And so the Lord is saying in your life right now, if that's an area where you want him to move, then you're going to have to learn how to open up and let go. You're going to have to learn how to say, all right, God, this is all yours. And by letting go, you begin to let God into that area of your life. He said, you say, God, why won't you do something? Why won't you do something? He said, I'm waiting for you to let go. I'm waiting for you to let go. And when you let go in that moment, you'll let me in. It's a decision that you have to make inside of your life. 
And for some of us, these are areas that torment us. They're areas that bother us. They're areas that, man, they, they cause us a lot of anxiety. They cause us a lot of worry. But do you know what Jesus said about worry? In the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 34, he said, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Some of us in our life, we're, we're worried about these things. We're worried, what if somebody finds out? Listen, you've been holding on to this way too long. The best thing you can do is open it up so that people can find out and that healing can come into your life. You know, there's a saying, I say it a lot, it's simply this, secrets keep you sick. Secrets keep you sick. If you're here today and you're living in secret, I didn't say that at any other service today, so I said that for you. Secrets keep you sick. Don't continue to live that way. The Lord wouldn't have you. That's an area you've got to open up. You've got to allow him into it. And then whatever he's going to do, you've got to let him do. But he's not going to be able to be in until you open it up and let him in. Amen? You know about worry, Francis Chan says this. He said, worry implies that we don't quite trust that God is big enough, powerful enough, or loving enough to take care of what's happening in our lives. If you're sitting here, you're worried about something, worried about something, I want to ask you, how big is God in your life? See, because sometimes when our problems are bigger than our God, our problems get to our attention and our focus. See, it's, it's not a problem issue. It's a, it's a faith issue. And so what we have to do is that we have to begin to build our faith up in God so God begins to grow in our mind and our life. And we realize no matter what it is, no matter what the doctor's report is, no matter what someone's holding over your head, no matter those fears or anxiety that keep you all bottled, no matter what that is, they're going to shrink when your God gets bigger. And so if you've got an issue that's plaguing you, something that you're worrying about, quit focusing on that problem and start focusing on God. And allow God to grow in your faith, to grow in your life. And as that happens, you're going to find those problems are just going to be, begin to shrink because you'll realize what true perspective is all about and who God really is. Amen? Amen. The last one is this. The Holy Spirit can speak through people that are in your life. You know, 1 Corinthians 12 talks a lot about that, about people, about groups, about what that is all about. It tells us in verse 27, now you are the body of Christ. Now remember, Paul is speaking to the church in Corinth. You are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. Each one of you is a part of it. When we talk about the church, remember, we're never talking about a building. We're not talking about bricks and mortar. We're talking about people. When you leave, this is just a building. When you come in, this is a church. It's the church because you are in it. You are the church. And in our lives, as we live, as we exist, sometimes God is going to use people to speak into our life. And what happens sometimes is that we become shut off to that. We have to be able to open up to that. I am often shut off to that. I am a very driven guy, so I always have a to-do list. Any other to-do listers out there? I love you guys. You guys are awesome. To-do lists are wonderful. And so I'm a, I'm a strong to-do list guy. Well, about, about a month ago, the Lord laid upon my heart. He says, I want you to introduce yourself to a new person every day. I said, oh, yeah, that's easy. Something else I get to check off. This will be easy. And as I began to try to check this off, I realized that I would often go days without ever meeting anyone new, without introducing myself to anyone, because I was so busy doing what, whatever I'm doing. And so I would go days and I said, man, this is a serious problem. I need to do something about this. Well, just the other day, I was sitting in the hospital waiting room, and now I know i got to put the check mark off that I need somebody. And so I'm sitting there, i got my headphones in, i got my computer open, I'm doing work. And then I realized, oh, i got to introduce myself to somebody. Right? So I take my headphones off, I look around, I'm in an empty waiting room, except for one hospital volunteer. I know he can't go anywhere. So, uh, so I'm like, all right, well, this is my guy. And so I'm like, hey, how's it going? My name's Greg. And I started talking to him a little bit. We got, we got going talking. He was 93 years old. He didn't look a day over 75. I'm just saying. All right? This guy's volunteering at the hospital. Right? I was so proud of this guy. And then, uh, not only that, so we start a conversation and we start talking. I found out he played racquetball 
every day. I was like, you see, his name was Lake. You know, like Lake Superior? That was his name, Lake, all right? You don't forget a name like that. So I got 93-year-old Lake standing there talk, you know, talking to me and telling me he played racquetball every single day. I used to play racquetball. I said, are you serious? I used to play racquetball. I said, I don't play racquetball anymore, though. I run. You know, I started talking to him about running. I was really excited about running. He looks at me. He's like, that's the problem. I'm like, what's up with that? What do you mean that's the problem, Lake? What's going on here, you know? He was like, well, that's your problem. I said, what do you mean that's, that's my problem? He said, well, he says, I play racquetball every day. He says, when I go in there, I go in a racquetball court. I step into this racquetball court. I play against one person. That's my opponent. And we go there and we play racquetball. I'm in there and I'm playing racquetball with him. I'm thinking of nothing else except the game before me. I'm thinking of nothing else except playing racquetball. In that moment and in that time, my brain turns off. He said, when you run, do you think? Do you think about your problems? I said, absolutely, I think about my problems. I'm able to focus in on my problems. He was like, well, that's your problem. I said, what do you mean that's my problem, Link? This is, Link, this is great. I'm, I'm able to do this. He says, no. He says, your brain needs to shut off. If your brain doesn't shut off, here's what he said. He says, if you don't find a way to shut your brain off, you're going to subtract years from your life. I was like, oh, man. I know the Holy Spirit was using this guy in the midst of that moment to let me know, pay attention to what you're doing with your life. Now, here's what I want to let you know, that if I wouldn't have taken the time to take my earphones out and focus my attention on a hospital volunteer who was sitting in the waiting room, would I have received that advice in my life? I wouldn't have. And I wonder how many times in the past the Lord has put a lake in a room with a message for me. But because I was so consumed with what I had to do that I missed hearing what God wanted to say. Now, maybe you're in this church right now and that's where you are. You're driven. You're focused. Maybe for some of you, you don't like people that much. And so you're happy being at home behind closed doors. Well, the Lord has people in your life that he wants to use to speak to you. But you have to be able to listen to them and what they have, want to say to you and be able to determine that that's from him and what you're going to do with that reality. See, if you get nothing else and you get that, that has the power to change your life forever. But what I'm going to say next has the power to set some of you free. Because not only is it the people you don't know that has the power to speak into your life, not only is it the people you like that has the power to speak into your life, but also the people that you can't stand. You know who they are. I said it and their picture came into your mind, right? Might be a coworker. Hope it's not a spouse. Uh, but it may be somebody inside of your life. Someone that you can't stand. God can use that person to speak to you. I remember a time in my life when I was a carny. It was a high point in my life. Yes, I was a carnival worker. Right? I was the guy responsible for carnival food. You know, that really healthy stuff like deep fried butter. You know, that was me. That was, that was my job. And the great thing, I got to meet my beautiful wife because of that job, because she knew the owners of the company. But I was the guy inside of the booth serving up this healthy food. Now, I worked for a guy that definitely wasn't a nice guy. He was really a crotchety, mean kind of guy. He had a couple of people that worked with him as managers, and then we were all there. Now, this guy didn't really treat his carny workers very well. It was not, not a lot of money, horrible hours, horrible treatment. The whole thing was no good. I was in a low point in my life, and I appreciated the opportunity to do something. And so I went ahead and I did this. And so I would work. And so when we would get back, so we would go out to a site, and afterwards we would come back. When we would come back, our job was to clean the fryers and clean the thing and wash the, the, the uh, trucks down and do all these things. While the three main owners, they sat around and they drank Killian's Red. I'll never forget that. They would sit around and just get drunk, drinking Killian's Red while I'm out here, you know, with the fry. I'm the fry guy. You know, with all this grease and nastiness. And I remember just, just this anger and angst would always rise into me whenever we pulled into that lot. Because I knew what I would have to do while these guys sat around and did nothing. 
Well, I remember this one day I finished cleaning the fryers and doing everything. I walked over to them as they sat around their little circle. I was like, I'm done. Time for me to go. I'm clocking out. And I'll never forget what the guy says to me, the main owner of the business. He turns, he looks at me, and he says these words. He says, Greg, he says, you're a good guy. There's no doubt about that. He said, your only problem is you're a seven-inning player. He said, you're no finisher. I remember looking at him, you know, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And I left. This is a guy I had no respect for. This is a guy I didn't like. But this is a guy who said these words to me, and they changed my life forever. You know, what he was saying is that you start really strong and you're pretty good in the middle. But when it comes to the end, you tuck her out. You don't finish the job. I made a decision in the midst of that moment that my entire life, I will be a finisher. That I will fight to the end, that I will run the race to the finish line, that I will not stop in the middle, that I will complete what needs to be done. Now here, this was advice from a guy I didn't respect, didn't like, and I was happy when I quit, all right? But his words penetrated me and changed my life forever. And I believe that these words have the power to change your life forever, too. Because the reality is, is that God is looking for finishers. He's not looking for people to start the race strong. He's not looking for people to reach the halfway mark. He's looking for people who are willing to complete and finish the race that's before him. So often I see people, they start really strong. But when difficulty strikes, when things get uncomfortable, they're ready to throw in the towel and they're ready to quit. Or maybe they just find themselves reaching this place where they just sit on their hands and they choose not to do anything. They say, yes, Lord, I know I'm going to heaven, but right now I'm just going to sit here and enjoy the ride. The Lord brought you this church in this moment right now to hear these words. God is looking for finishers. He wants to know, are you willing to finish the race? Are you willing to keep going? We can relate with running the race and everything is going great and everything is going fine and then something happens. Something happens and it deters us and it stops us and we fall down and we feel like we need to quit. We feel like we're going to quit. God would encourage you in the midst of this moment today, don't quit, don't give up, and don't be deceived. You see, you don't have to run that race alone. The beautiful message of God to each and every single one of us is that, yes, we are called to run the race, that we are called to be finishers, that we are called to finish, yet we don't have to run this race alone. That's the beautiful message of Jesus Christ. It's the beautiful message of the Holy Spirit coming into our lives to lead and guide us, direct us and correct us. The beautiful message is that you never have to run the race of life alone. My question for you this morning is simply this. Will you open your heart? Will you open your life? Will you follow after him? For some of you, will you get back up and start running again? For others, will you commit to be a finisher and not stop? The answer is between you and the Lord. Let's pray today. Will you bow your heads with me, please? Lord God, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for your word. I thank you for encouragement. I thank you for the message to each and every single one of us, to not give up. To keep moving forward, to rise up and realize that we are not alone in this race of life, that you are here with us. And Father, I just pray for each and every single one of us that in our lives, that we will respond to your work in our lives. The Holy Spirit, when you nudge us, when you direct us, that, that we will follow that leading. When, when, when the fire begins to happen, when difficulty begins to strike, that we will trust you in the midst of it. And Lord God, when we fall, we'll commit to get back up. We'll commit to keep moving. We'll commit to keep running the race before us. And we'll commit to keep our arm around you, to keep you close in our lives knowing that with you, all things are possible. And I know, Lord, that there may even be some here today that have to begin that journey, begin that race, that you're there and they're on the starting block and you're about to, to pull that trigger and they're about to take off. 
as they put their hope and their trust in you, as they stop trusting in themselves and their money and their opportunity and their stuff and their things and their ideas and their intellect, and they, they just begin to trust completely in you. And maybe you're here today and that's the place where you are. You hear about Jesus Christ and, and you know that you haven't made a decision yet to follow him, but you know that you want that in your life. If you're here today, just sitting right where you are in this, in this church building, I, I want to say a prayer with you. Here's what I want you to do. If, if that's where you're at, you want to follow Jesus today. You want to commit your heart and you want to commit your life to him. I want you just to do something. I want you to lift up your hand and I want you to lift up your eyes and I want you to look at me. And I'm going to say a prayer with you in just a minute. So if you're here and say, yes, I want to follow Jesus, I want you just to lift up your hand so I can see it. Is there anyone here? Is there anyone here? I see you, I see you, I see you. Is there anyone else that says, yes, that's me, I see you. I see you. Hands all over this place are saying yes to Jesus for the very first time. Others, I know you're already following after Jesus, and I want you to say this prayer with those that are saying it for the very first time. Say these words. Say, Jesus. I surrender to you. My entire life is yours. I'm sorry for my yesterdays, for the stuff that I've done or haven't done. But I thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for me and to offer me life a life eternal. Help me follow you today and every day for the rest of my life. I just want to pray for you, God. I pray for each and every single person that's here today. So many people making a decision to follow after you. I just pray, Lord, that you keep your hands around them, holding them, keeping them safe, directing them, leading them, guiding them. Lord God, I know that as long as they rest in your hands, that nothing can ever take them out. Nothing can ever pluck them out of your hand, Lord. Keep them safe. I pray that in Jesus' name.